Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Ruthless Aggression Era podcast. As always, I am your host, Mel Matt, and joining me this week is... Mox. Yeah, Mox has been brought back for this episode. How are you today, good sir? Doing well. How are you? I'm doing well myself. Been a pretty pretty busy day today, but other than that, things are pretty good. So tonight's topic will be on. It's going to be a double episode tonight. Um, not only will we be talking about WrestleMania 19, the game, but we will also be talking about Lita's book, Lita A Less Traveled R.O.A.D., The Reality of Amy Dumas. And that that's why I wanted you on this um, episode, because I knew that you were a big Lita fan, as am I. Yes. You, you, you finally give me some... Um... Meet him the bone of, because like, I've been old, not to say bones like within two consecutive sentences, but like, man, you made me watch a lot of bad crap. But okay, like, okay, this is not like the, the greatest pay per view or anything because we're not talking about a pay per view, but I can get behind talking about lead up. No pun intended. See, I, I give you good topics to talk about every once in a while. Every once in a while, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. Oh, no, just just you wait. In a, in a couple months, it's going to be even better than this. All right, <laughs> whoa, whoa. Before you get started... I have something to say. Oh, the album review. <laughs> Dang it. I'm not sure what I've done to you in life, but... <laughs> but I'm doing well. Friday night. Yep, and so I guess we can go ahead and begin for WrestleMania 19. There's not much really to say about this one. Really, but it is a fun game. I believe it's the first GameCube game I ever played, so it does have some sentimental value with me. And, th- and this was exclusive on GameCube, correct? Yeah, exclusive on GameCube. I mean, it, 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 stuff like that doesn't really happen too much nowadays, but um, I mean, it, it does. Like, there's a new Spider Man game that's going to be. Exclusively on PS4, which I am still, which being a Xbox One owner and not having a PS4, I am very salty about. But <clears throat> flip those shoes, and I'm a PS4 owner that um, lucky that on me, and I don't have an Xbox One, so like I'm either way, I'm I'm good. <laughs> but yeah, um, this happened a lot back then. Um, there were games that would be sort of exclusive to a particular console. Um, the SmackDown games were exclusive to the PS2. Um, the Raw games were exclusive to the Xbox, the original Xbox. Um, the WrestleMania games, for the most part, would be exclusive to the GameCube. Um, there would be just th- this little exclusives that they would do for that. And this is probably one of my favorite WWE games, at least of this era, if not all time. And that's purely to do with the story mode. Because it's a very unusual story mode. And and, um, from what you've shown me, this isn't like an in-ring. We settle things in the ring. Not until the very end. Okay, the, the very end. <clears throat> like th- this is more of a game within a game kind of mm, sort of sort of concept like the the idea behind the story mode is that you play as a superstar or 
a Kree superstar. And the idea is that you have been fired for whatever reason by Vince McMahon. And you are literally thrown out of WWE. Like the opening scene is like two security guards are dragging you. It's like a POV shot. It's shot from your point of view. And so they literally throw you out of the building. And then um, when you wake up, you see Stephanie McMahon. And Stephanie McMahon says that she's planning to take over WWE. And so she enlists you to take revenge on Vince and the WWE. And there's four areas in which you can battle. And there's the harbor, the shopping mall, the parking garage, and the construction site. And there's not, various different missions that you can do. Not quite so much. Um, and help me here. The last game I reviewed with you, um, where they're like not even really wrestlers, just in cars. There's some of that aspect. So I guess it's not what. Everybody knows now, like the 2K stuff, not just in ring. Mm, it, it's not a typical like season mode. There's there's some underlying gaming elements to it. If you yeah, will. yeah. Like um, in the parking garage, like you have to put people through cars um, and trucks. You have to literally throw people into traffic and then uh, the very the final mission of that area is where you actually have to swing on chains to get to a perch and swing on a couple more chains to get to the final boss um just just your because you've done a lot of both and I don't know how to question this right. Versus the, like, it, it's strictly in ring, or even if it's like a fall count anywhere, and you can go outside the ring with no DQ, you can do other things outside the ring. I, what have you liked better than the, um, the outside of the, the realm stuff? With the, the past two, two games, I've discussed with you or the more in ring stuff, like what it's been. It, it's tough to say because I like both. I, I probably lean a bit more towards the outside the ring stuff, if only because there's really only a few games that have done that. And, that, and that's what makes games like Crush Hour and WrestleMania 19 so unique. Those yeah. are really the only two games I can think of off the top of my head that really have, like, this is a typical wrestling game. And I think that's what really makes them stand out from stuff like 2K18 or even something like WWE Raw 2 or SmackDown vs. Raw or something like that. Uh, and I mean, Crush Hour, I, that was a mm -hmm. game I, you told me about, it and I was like, oh, that sounds really cool. Crush out of it that I'm in, and and I could see both sides of it, but just from like from you, I've never played played either of the, the games, Crush Hour or WrestleMania 19, the game, and from what you've shown and described, like I would I would also be hard pressed on. Like, do I just want to have wrestling matches, or do I want a, a game within the game? Yeah, because you can do exhibition matches in this game as well. Oh, you can? Yeah. And the final part of the revenge mode is that you face off against Vince in the wrestling match. You, you get your, your payback. Yeah. And 
Uh, getting stuff out the harbor. Like you throw people into the harbor. Um, uh, in the shopping mall, you pretty much destroy the entire shopping mall. The final mission on that is where you have to destroy the enemy's car. The construction site, you just throw off people off the construction site into just darkness. Um, it's a really violent game. <laughs> it really yeah. is. Definitely came out before the PT era. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, this is September two thousand three. Uh, a segment where uh, like train tracks and trains are involved. Um, I, don't, I don't think train tracks are involved, train, but I, I, I might be confusing train tracks with like throw them off of higher part of the road and maybe right in the parking garage. garage. <laughs> That's same difference, basically. Like uh, you're dead. <laughs> seems like a fun game. It, it seems oh, it like is. something that would be, uh, and I don't want to say like, if it wasn't for the PG era, like it, it seems like a, a very fun, because it, it's an actual game. It's not just match after match and like there's an actual difference if you will from this mode of what everybody's accustomed to with the 2k18 or the 2k series versus you know this and crush hour were uh yes you're you're talking about wrestlers and Yes, it's a WWE game, but it's not just like you go to the ring. Yeah, I mean, and there was also that canceled WWE game called WWE Brawl, which would have been like kind of like, I guess, like a Mortal Kombat type game where it's just fighting in various areas. That would have been fun. That would have been so cool. Yeah. Um, Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter kind of. And I would like for W to just kind of, not necessarily every single game that they do, but every once in a while, just kind of go outside the box and do something a bit creative like that. And I agree. That's, you, you said just in, in that sentence, said it better than I I, not everything has to be so, I don't want to say cut and dry, but even when they will allow you to do bad safe stuff or make certain rules or I, make it more gaming than what, what you're lately they've been doing gaming as. Give us some kind of back then but with today's roster like have, have fun with it and I, I know I'm not making any sense <laughs> I never do yeah, but but yeah like the, the game is just a lot of fun, so I would definitely recommend it. Um, the interests on that game are a bit weird. They, they're they definitely stilted, to say the least. Um, it's not the perfect game in the world. Like it, It's definitely, in terms of like graphics and presentation and stuff like that, it's definitely a product of its time. Yeah, I, I can see that. It is a product of the time of 2003, but even so, it's still a really fun game. It definitely a step up from uh, the previous wrestling game on GameCube, which was WrestleMania 18, which um, was not a good game at all. Um, probably one of the weakest three games that 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 they've ever done. Um, but overall, WrestleMania 19 really fun game, um, especially due to the um, story mode, revenge mode. So if you can find it, definitely check it out. Definitely. Um, play because it's a really fun game. 
Do you agree that um, the the player mode and the, the 2K 2K mode, like if they were to come out with the secondary, like actual game kind of mode thing, if you will, like if it would not be just as fun, especially now that we're I mean, we're talking. 2003 and 2018 graphics would be better, glitches would hopefully be like that kind of thing needs to. Yeah, because right. that is one thing that 2K does tend to struggle with. Um, the fact that they, they never really have that good of a season mode. Um, 2K18's my career mode was probably the best it's been, um, but it still wasn't perfect. And then, and this, I'm, you know, billionaire, millionaire. But if they would do something like a, an actual 2K, like it, it's wrestling. And then do this kind of stick thing of, here's your wrestlers. Pick who you want to be, and here. like gaming has gotten so big. I got I can see a, a, an avenue for both. Like you could do your 2K team or your 2K stuff, and also I mean, because hey, it, it wasn't bad. You know when when it wasn't just the in ring wrestling or matches if it was uh, good because a it was hard again i know we're good <laughs> But yeah, um, final thoughts on WrestleMania 19. Um, it's a fun game. Definitely recommend it. Yeah, it looks like it. It seems like it, it seems a little frustrating, but at the same time, I'm, oh god, is it? That's what, that makes games fun, though, right? Yeah, a, a little bit, a little bit. Completing a game easily takes. Someone is a fun out of it. You shouldn't just be able to. Complete a game. Okay, move that. Next. Just my opinion. Yeah. But yeah, WrestleMania 19, fun game. Definitely recommend it. It's awesome. So now we move on to the main event of this episode, and that's Lita, A Less Traveled Road, R-O-E-D, The Reality of Amy Dumas. And I wanted to ask you, Mox, um, how did you first become a fan of Lita? Um... Can I preface that by saying that, like, Lita, Lita captured me as a fan. Like, as soon as I saw Lita, she, um, well, I asked a question, I guess I didn't mention it. Sure. Yeah, she, Because, she, I know, she was, because, because right. I know you're a fan of Lita. Yes, I'm Lita all day. She was so out of the norm. She wasn't what we were being presented with. Not only could she wrestle, not only could she do spots. She was a worker. 
she could, it's not, uh, and I don't want to say this because it's not my podcast, but um, she, uh, I was just, she wasn't the norm of what we were being presented at or what was going on at the time. Like she kind of broke the mold. Yeah, certainly, certainly. I, I became a fan um, around when I started watching wrestling a, a bit afterwards. It wasn't really until 2003 that I really became a fan of her, um, mainly because she was out for a while with um, a neck injury. And so by the time that I, I really, really started watching and really paying attention, um, she was out for about a year with a broken neck. But when she did come back, um, she was definitely one of my favorites. Um, just to, to say, we went from basically no women's wrestling at all to attitude error, like even pre attitude error, women in the ring. And we, I don't have to go in depth on that, to holy crap. Not only in my opinion, is she good looking? But also, she she knows how to, to work. She can do moves. She can she knows how to sell. Like I was instantly not just not even close to just being looks, but Oh, that's what's been missing in one of these wrestling. As far as the, at, at the time, WWF was concerned like that. Oh, yeah, you, there was Trish. Uh, Trish and I'll, I'll shut up before I take some people off. <laughs> but yeah, so her book came out in 2003, um, right? I think it was right before she came back or right after. I can't remember exactly when. I think it was right after she came back. Um, have you ever been able to um, read the book? Uh, no, I've, I've read, read excerpts of it, but I've, and what did you think? What you think from the ex- excerpts? I, I feel it was genuine, and because she, the excerpts I've read are, <coughs> excuse me. They don't seem like very kayfabe. It, this is where like we go from Lita to Amy DeMoss. Like that's like this is this was my or is my experience. Like I, I don't. From what I've, I've I've seen of the book, what I've read from it, like she was being very honest, and this goes to even you know angles that were portrayed that she didn't really appreciate. Not I say appreciate when she didn't really. Like say this was wrong or that was wrong. Okay, this happened. There, there's um, other ones that 
Uh, now looking back today, 15 years later, I don't know, uh, it's so hard to talk about. Not hard to talk about, just hard to, to describe, if you will. She's had a, a long journey. Got a long path. Uh, things happen. And I don't mean to undermine things. It's just no, things happen. I don't mean that any other way than stuff happen. Which in the course of things were reflected by it. read the book what do you think yeah. um yeah i have read the book and i will say it's like the last book i read on the podcast was hollywood hulk hogan and that was with biff and i think it is safe to say um this is way better this is much better it almost by default has to be i mean at least this book doesn't have hogan claiming that he and Andre sold out Shea Stadium rather than San Martino and Larry Zabisco. Yeah. Um, I think she was being very honest. Again, just the... I guess the... I don't want to say high point, just because I, again, have not read front cover and back cover. Just, Alita is still to this day my favorite women's wrestler of all time. Not because of looks, not because of this or that, just I gravitated towards Lita. Same here. And and she um again, I I, I haven't read it word for word. But what I have seen, and I, and what the the biggest point is, I haven't seen any contradiction to what she said. Where it's been, yeah, that happened. Okay, good or bad, but there there hasn't been a calling out of. That I remember her saying. No, that didn't really happen. Like it, it was a very honest book. Again, from what I've seen of the book, from what I've read of the book. Yeah. yeah, it's a it's a pretty good book, certainly. It wasn't how it comes across, even not reading every word on every page. Uh, there was no real publicity behind it. I, I wrote a book because I'm going to make money by shaming this company or this person. It, it was literally a, I just want to tell my story. This is what it was like, and does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I think so. So the book opens up with a foreword by Matt Hardy, which is awkward to, to read yeah. about in hindsight. That's awkward. Very. So it's 56 chapters in the book. And 
chapter one is Leah talking about her childhood. She had had a very mean younger brother as a kid. I was never a, a mean. I've always been the younger brother, but I was never mean. So I'm. That's when the. Are you, next are you sure? <laughs> How can I be the mean young brother when I've never been? Well, okay, you're younger than I, so <laughs> yeah, I. I guess on occasion I can be. You're meaner to me than I am to you, though. So. True. True. <laughs> I didn't mention a certain restaurant yet, so y you have to admire that. Yeah. I'll think about it. <laughs> she, she just comes across and this is again, no word good. If, if I don't need a tell all from Paige, but mm -hmm. if, if you know, we're talking 2003 when this book came out, if 2018, 15 years later, Paige came out with just a like, I, I could kind of see the uh, resemblance in the word, but. Like she didn't really, Amy DeMoss, aka Lita, did not like her book wasn't just like a like I say a, a tell all. It wasn't just like, let me tell you everything that it was a uh, here's my experience. Yeah, it's her life story. Yeah, up to that point. And I think what makes the book uh, a lot more unique is that throughout the book, there's like a various top 10 lists. And here are her top 10 most vivid memories of her childhood. One was catching lightning bugs at her grandparents' house in St. Louis. Number two, collecting little snails after it rained in a winter park. Walking along the railroad tracks with her dad and finding special pink rocks to bring back home. Having an imaginary friend named Mickey. Her parents had a dinner party the night before her brother and her were having her portrait photographed. And she ended up cutting off all of her hair. And now she had a little bowl cut. Six was spending weekends with her grandmother. Seven was... Um, Pee Wee's Big Adventure, imitating the bicycle scene. And she also says that Pee Wee's Big Adventure is her all time favorite movie. It was hanging from the top of the swing set, falling and knocking her tooth out on the swing below. Getting stitches after falling off of a jungle gym at school. And number 10, always procrastinating when cleaning her room on chores. Isn't that like basically. Not to take away from the the struggles, like at all, like because there were a couple in there. But okay, um, I'm a, a few years older than Lita, aka or Amy DeMoss, aka Lita. Like that's what. But at the same time, like yes. You're, and I, I hate to use this, and I really do, because there is no, in my eyes, I have a wife that has cerebral palsy, I have a son that has cerebral palsy, there is no normality, there is no normal, but yes, that's what everybody went through growing up when I grew up, like, 
yes, we we all. Now, again, and this might be my whole, everything has to be capitalized. I know we're good. <laughs> but she, she's just a person. She's a person that was good to great at wrestling. I consider great. Mileage may vary. We're we're all people. We've we've been down that road, and she made it so like, hey, and, and um, so much crap has come out in the last few days. Um. Not about her. Ah, uh, shoot. How do I put this? Like, okay, we're, we're, if, if you're a leader, if you're a, Amy DeMoss, Amy DeMoss playing leader on TV, and you've gone through this, then that speaks volumes to it's okay to have gone through that. Like, it doesn't make you different. It doesn't make you odd. It's okay to have gone through that. Like, who has it? Yeah, because Leah says in the book that she moved, that she and her family moved around a lot as a kid due to her dad's job. And her father was pretty, pretty distant, not necessarily on purpose, but it was sort of like that old, old school kind of fatherhood. Kind of like a, a military family. Sort of, sort of. Yeah. I mean, that's have a nine year old. Like, you know. you know. We've moved, just not military wise. Just Fighter, fighter for years, and, and and you get moved around, and, and where's not where's the money, but like what's going to be what's best for his future, kind of thing. And yeah, because we because we used to have worked in um, wall coverings. I, I'm, I get all that, and now this is a, a topic for a different show, I guess. But we moved a, a, a lot around. I, and well, I'll, I'll say this point: the stability. Um, Hey, we grew up in this house, lived in this house my entire life. That's all well, well and dang. Sometimes that can't always happen. It's not an excuse. It's not a reason. Yeah, so the next few chapters talk about her um, discovering punk, being a part of the punk community, interacting with bands like Seven Seconds and stuff like that. Oh, we're not talking about seeing punk. No, this is punk uh, music. I know. I was, <laughs> I was trying to break the attention. Yeah. Um, And that's one of the excerpts of red. Oh, that's neat. Okay, now we have 
know, everything forms everybody, no matter what. Whether it's music or environment, things shape people. And that's that's pretty neat to find out that punk rock influenced her. Yeah, like, um, it's not necessarily my kind of music per se. Like, I like a few punk bands, like the Ramones and Sex Pistols and stuff like that, but it was never like a genre that I really gravitated to or anything like that. I was really more into like heavy metal and stuff like that, like classic rock, um, thrash metal, stuff like that, progressive metal and stuff. I'm not really into it myself. I got. The two bands you, you name, like it, it's not my thing, but mm -hmm. if, it, if it's somebody else's thing or if they got her, like, hey, or she could attach to something, okay. No, but they're, they're I, not my thing. Yeah. Right. I got the time frame would have been different. Hey, you kind of steer you to something else. You know, listen to this, or like that might have happened. But yeah. So uh, the next few pieces of the book talk about her um, finding an apartment and getting a dog named Cody, and. Uh, Cody immediately gets hit by a car, like right as soon as Leah brings him home, because uh, her dog really does go through a lot of stuff. Like he's sick a lot of the time. Like he's a real survivor. If I remember correctly, or Ray correctly. The same day, I think it was before they named him Cody. I might be remembering wrong, but he just took off. Yeah. And shit. Oh, sorry. And shoot. Um, And as a pet lover, I have three dogs. I had a cat. Pets are great. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's got to be. And this was like her, if I remember correctly. Like, hey, we'll bring a dog in the house and I don't have to bring it into the house before that happened. Okay. Damn. Yeah, so we also get Leah's top 10 favorite dog breeds. One Mutt, two Doberman, three Pitbull, four Labrador, five Border Collie, six Great Dane, seven English Bull Mastiff, eight Cavalier King Charles Spaniel, Nine Boston Terrier and ten Greyhound. Okay, A, she likes big dogs. B, oh, Michael Cole, damn it. The big dog. Okay, she likes <laughs> big dogs, but she also has a very um, like none of those, um, not all of those are, are big dogs. Not so big. Is this her, per her personality? Oh, yeah. Because she Leo is a lifelong animal lover, especially dogs. Yeah. 
but she also recognized that she wasn't always the, the biggest dog in the fight, but brought the dog to the fight, if that makes sense. Right. Underestimate, underestimate all, underestimate all you want. Yeah. I'm still kick your ass. I'm, I'm reading my A game no matter what. So. I kind of thought Amy. I, I thought Amy would be a Amy leader. Would be a more fifty fifty on big dog versus. The, the smaller dog breed. But she's not wrong, really. And it ends up leading her to get her first job at a animal shelter. At Montrose Animal Hospital, I believe. Rabbit trail here for just a second. I think I didn't know. And this is when she also ended up finding out about the Kurt Cobain's death. And uh, one of her co-workers had a really heavy certain accent. And she would always go, they gawed. So apparently that co-worker came in and she said, they gawed. That Kurt Cobain done shot himself in the head, y'all. And she said it was, it was just the craziest delivery of bad news she had ever heard. News versus delivery of news. Whole other difference. Yeah, so she ends up moving around Washington, D.C. a little bit, just outside of Washington, D.C. And she ended up getting the word punk tattooed on the inside of her lower lip. CM Punk, CM Punk, CM Punk. Oh, sorry. You know, I had to. <laughs> um, it, 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 it's so. Say, I guess the like I had to. She yeah, we. CM Punk, or not CM, but just the Punk tattoo. Yeah. Before. CM Punk was our art of wrestling, but he was in a WWE and he wasn't a champ for sure. So yeah, Punk tattoo. He was just starting out, I think. This is about the time frame that I got into the um, message boards and stuff. And oh man, some of the things you could have, I can tell you, tell you about what you could have seen. Oh, no, no, that's, it's not the same.
she was a punk. And she was a punk rocker. She was a punk rocker before CM Punk made a punk rock wrestler cool. In my opinion. Yeah, so something interesting happens here next. Um, we decided to plan a European um, trip, but in order to do that, but in order to do that, she ends up becoming a stripper. And the songs that she danced to um, at her audition were Justify My Love by Madonna, Blondie's Rapture, Fell on Black Days by Soundgarden, and a song by Prince. Eventually, she makes enough money to go to Europe, and in 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 Amsterdam, that's where she ends up getting her famous shoulder tattoo. She says that it doesn't really represent anything; it just represents independence and spontaneity because she just went over there and did it. She's been steadfast on that. That's the reasoning and the, the meaning. And she's even beyond the book. Like, I, I got it because I, I could and I wanted to. Like, it, 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 there's some meaning to it. In her, but why she decided to do it at that time. She could and she would. Yeah, and after this, she ends up being the roadie for her one of her favorite bands, 15. Searching the fifteen song, aren't you? Ah, uh, I'm what? I'm fifteen. Uh, honestly, I have no clue who they are. To be honest, all I know is that they're a punk band, and that's about it. I've heard two songs. Yeah. So um, one day after that, her boyfriend was watching WCW Nitro, and um, before this, Lita was sort of dismissive of um, wrestling in general, because to her, wrestling was just a bunch of rednecks big punching each other, a lot of overweight guys and speedos being really bad actors, but she ends up watching it, and um, she ends up being drawn to the luchadors, specifically Rey Mysterio. Another credit for Rare Mysterio's career. Whether it's in ring, we're drawn to. Like if we had me to turn like, oh, I like this guy. Yeah, I'll take him. Like, Yeah, so and her first wrestling show ends up being a WCW Nitro show. And she ended up getting to go backstage and seeing Glacier and Van Hammer and guys like that. Did she mention I'm not gonna re mention it on here. Wow. 
Wow. Okay. The, the, who did I mention? Yep. I, that's that who she says in the book. Like, wow. Okay. And she ends up um, training in judo for a bit. And because she's so inspired by the luchadors, that's when she sort of made the decision that she wants to learn how to wrestle. So, so she ends up going to Mexico to learn the lucha libre style. And she ends up accidentally buying a ticket for the circus. There was one of the um, weeks where um, lucha libre was preempted by the circus. So she ends up interacting with CMLL. It's fascinating how not just we're talking about Rita and Iman, but how some of the best ever or at least greats or notable names even got into wrestling. Like it's fascinating. You do have this um, segment of, I grew up watching it, I wanted to be a wrestler. But you also have this segment of, I don't want to say accidental, accidental. But, like, it just kind of, I don't want to say happened, but, oh, I like that, I can do that. I can probably be good at that. Yeah, one of the first people that she befriended in CMLL was uh, then unknown Val Venus. Back when he was working as Steel. Better not have a towel on. Okay, well, I said that the exact opposite. You better have more than just a towel on. You're telling me the story. (laughs) But you hear that quite a a bit of... Like, you you have your... I don't want to say sections, but... Like, okay, um... My dad or my mom were in the business. I grew up watching it. Had no idea about it, but then I started loving it and became a fan. Like there's so many segments of how different wrestlers became wrestlers. Right. She also sees people like Tajiri and um, and then unknown SREOs. So she ends up going to a mid-Atlantic wrestling school for a bit. And she and that's when she first ends up meeting the Hardy Boys. Team Extreme. Team Extreme. Mm-hmm. 
So she ends up joining the ECW from there as Angelica and later as Miss Congeniality. And neither one really fit for, I guess they kind of did, Angelica and Miss Congeniality. And this might be just uh, well, um, looking back. Well, well, there is a good story about how she got the name Angelica. Because that one show she was at, she was managing Fallen Angel Christopher Daniels. And they had Angelica to her. And that's how she got Angelica. Yeah. And, and can we just take a... Uh, Christopher Daniels is still wrestling. Yeah, like I'm, I'm, I'm very surprised he hasn't been signed by WWE ever. I'm surprised at, at two things. That and, um, and since we're predating, like before we knew Hardy Boys or Angelica, and Christopher Daniels is still in the picture like holy crap dude's been doing it for a long long time yeah he really has And originally, Paul Heyman's original idea for her was to basically be biker taker in ECW. She would ride out on a motorcycle. And, you know, even looking back, she could pull it off. Yeah. Yeah, she could. Like, she just be a badass um, intergender matches women's matches. You take her and you put her on a motorcycle and that's her entrance. Like, yeah, she could pull it off. You put, um, and I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus here, but you put Sable on a motorcycle trying to run right in the ring. I don't know if that's going to work very well. No, it, it wouldn't have worked. Yeah. But I, I can see, you know, Pulling that off, or, yeah, I'm a badass. Like, yeah, I don't care. If you have a penis or not, or you know what your problem is. I'm I'm here to kick ass and take names. She just had that that aura about it. Yeah, so she ended up being paired with Danny Doring and Roadkill instead. And Roadkill did not like her, especially after Alita um, ended up bombing in, her, in his van. Well, when, when most people are like, ah, you're not my favorite person anymore. You just threw up in my van. I mean, they clean it up, but still. And we get an interesting Boba Ray Dudley story here. And I think it's pretty interesting considering what's recently happened. Um, Boba Ray Dudley was apparently pissed off that the Hardy Boys apparently used the 3D remove. And he also says um, when Lita when Lita came to WWE, he actually asked her, "Why did you come here? You had a made an ECW. You're never going to be anything but TNA here." And 
Bubba Ray was described by Lee as being very difficult. I, th- I think we, it, it's not 100% clear. Yeah, I, I think that's safe to say. He's. I don't really want to get into all that because it's less with four or five days. It's one thing I'm going to do. But Bully Ray had no room to just be the main match doing up. Honoring spot, or it's kind of pointless to, in my opinion, to keep talking about it. Uh, I'm just, okay, okay. The revival gave a, a spot to. Tags him. And going to call them out on Twitter and how dare you kind of thing. Eh, I, you did it more than once. Yeah, because the Dolby Boys used the Doomsday device. Yeah, like, how, like that's. Everybody wants to be so mad for whatever reason. I do the homage is homage. Whether it was in the finish or not. They're paying homage. Let people argue how they want to argue and have their sides. And I'll just be here and be a happy mom. Not happy mom, but I'll just be either happy or quiet mom. So do that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. The majority of the ECW locker room didn't seem to be very nice or like Francine apparently talks behind her back. Nice to her face, but we always talk about her behind her back in a negative light. I said this before on this podcast, on my own podcast. I just don't sometimes skip social media. Like, I get it, we're to a degree of. Hey, I want likes, I want retweets, I want to be. But then I don't, so I'll just leave that at that. Like, um, none of that makes sense to me. When it comes right. To like if, if your name is Bubba Ray or Bully, Regardless of what, what promotion you're in, isn't your name always, not always, but already kind of important enough? Like you don't need to, you know, I'll stop right there. You don't need to throw other people under the bus that are actually trying to get to your quote unquote level of, yeah. Well, we do get a moment of clarity, though, because Lita and Jerry Lynn end up um, in a legit wrestling match, and Lita ends up tapping out Terry, um, t- tapping out Jerry Lynn. Isn't and that really know. considered a, a moment of clarity? Mm, I don't know. I, 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 I thought it was kind of fun. That was kind of fun. It, it was fun, but I you know. Is it like a? I get what you're saying. I just had to be a part of it. 
for a second. Just you have Lita and Jerry win. Like it, just going into it. Like, is there any clar- clarity coming out of it? Like, regardless of what happens. Sorry, bad joke, bad joke. Hmm. Sorry. Yeah, we we at least got that much head of it. Okay, Terry Lynn, shut up. Let's move on. That kind of thing. So, um, we begin begins training some more at Dory Funk Jr.'s dojo. And um, one of her matches ends up getting sent to WWE, and she gets signed by WWE. And Dory Funk. I, I, I won't put him quite above Stu Hart, but Dory Funk has done a lot to he sees talent and he knows how to work with that talent all them however you want to word it hey you're you're good here you're not so good here story punks was a pretty good trainer Yeah, so when she ends up going to WWE, she ends up getting paired with um, SREOs. How would you feel about that pair? I do not like it. It was just such a odd. There you go. Kind of. And especially in the the timing of when it happened. Like, hey, nothing else to do, kind of thing. Like, uh, it wasn't for me. No. Yeah, and the leader even says that. Like, it, she, she says that she basically seemed like, you know, they both had red hair and tattoos. That was the entirety of the logic that went into it. Yeah, uh, that was. Uh, Hey, you have tattoos, you have this color hair, you have tattoos. It's like making a, a mix stable just based on things that they did not like, actually in ring wise match. Like it, it was just like, oh, we have this and we have this and this. hey, let's, let's put them together. Yeah, and from and from this partnership is where she gets the name Lita. Yes. Well, if there is one thing that came out of it is this is where she gets the, the moniker Lita. Like at least that came out. Of yeah, it. the name was given to her by a going. Oh, the name was given to her by Adam Panucci, who was the one of the producers who would, who would put together um, all those video packages, and it was uh, a Spanish twist on Lolita. Yes, that's... And now, uh, I might be mistaken again, this is years ago. I'm old, and, um, but I believe it was... If it wasn't actually said, it was... Um, Kind of said of Lita comes from Lolita, and that was, and I don't want to go further than that of what Lolita means. But here we are. So eventually, um, SREOs and we are separated. And Lita gets paired with the Hardy Boys because um, they were traveling together at the time, and they really liked the uh, the instant chemistry that they had. So that's how that came about. And 
And uh, we get some interesting insight on Jeff here from Lita. Like she says, uh, in the past year or so, Jeff has become very distant. He tends to isolate himself, so we don't hang out as much as we used to. And it seems like Jeff doesn't hang out with much of anyone these days. This, this is from the book, correct? Yeah, it's from the book that was written in 2003. Okay. Um, and where your like, pieces of the puzzle can put together. Jeff, and I hate using the word drugs. Yeah, a, a little bit. Like she would always say that Jeff was always late to them whenever they needed to be going. Yeah, no, no, and that's. Um, not an acceptable excuse, but this is when Jeff really got into. And I'm saying that on my own. I don't thought being a former drug user himself. And the same way happened later in TNA, so like he shelled himself. So he open it. Hey, let's have a, a barbecue kind of thing. You know, it's, he, he's doing his thing. If you will. What he sends me to. Like you before, no one will like you now. Once you get in that world, A, it's hard to become in that world. B, it's a lot harder to get out of that world. And I've been in both. And I, I can see what she's saying. But the distance is. Okay, he, he wasn't worried about you. He worried about other things at the moment. Yeah. I mean, it's good to see that Jeff is now more or less mostly clean. I mean, still a few slips off the wagon every now and then, but it's not quite as bad as it used to be. Yeah. Going from hard drugs, from experience, going from hard drugs to alcohol, neither one are good for you, but just from, and this is in my opinion, this is living through it. And yes, I, I do need to quit drinking. Like I, I know that I'm not. I'm not it's not as bad as what I've been through with drugs. Yeah, I, I guess you're referring to his um, DWI, DUI. And this got real serious when I didn't make it to. Oh, it's fine. I'm glad you're doing better now. Was that not just great? It, it not great. Um, shit. Oh, excuse me. Shoot. 
um, how the, they switch that around and, and storyline with Ed, which was true, like that, that was. Am I jumping ahead in chapter two? No, not really. I, I don't think so. I don't think so. And how, because it, this is when I really got into, uh, not really got into, but like, oh, people on the internet talk about wrestling outside of you know, sheets and stuff. Like, there's forums, there's boards. Oh, okay. I'll be able to talk about or talk to about wrestling. And the whole Matt Hardy. Lead of. Like that, that was a whole. Okay. My like cafe was already pretty much done for me. Then I'm like, oh, okay, things are interesting. I mean, you had three of my all-time favorites, Edge, Lito, Matt Hardy. Like, I'm, my ears do perk up. Surely this is a, a story storyline and lo and behold like none of this anyway it's your podcast now I'll shut up now and let you <laughs> so we get Lita's top 10 favorite restaurants number one Chevy's number two Yamato's and Sanford Number three, Outback. Number four, Quiznos. Number five, Cracker Barrel. Number six, Waffle House. Number seven, Trips. Number eight, Jamba Juice. Number nine, Taco Bell. And number 10, Tortillas in Atlanta, RIP. I am very disappointed there is no Burger King on that list. <laughs> I'm very disappointed in a lot of things. I don't think I can be a Lido fan anymore. That is a crappy list. What the? Keeping in mind that this was 2003. What the crap? That's not a good list, even in 2003, to have. Why? Why is it not a good list? Um, seven of them? Out of the ten, like even in two thousand three, sucked. Oh, like, which the... one sucked? <coughs> one by one, repeat one to ten. Now. Chevy's. Okay, Chevy's. I can't. I can't speak on it because never had it. So. Yamato's and Sanford. Outback. How how is that a, a and the, so it's kind of like Australian for beers. No, that's not how this works. What do you have against the Bloom and Onion? <laughs> okay, now, the Bloomin' Onion came out like after 2003, so their bl uh, Bloomin' Onion is fantastic. Uh, but everything else is just so manufactured. Mm, I like the steaks. What's next? <laughs> Quiznos. Quiznos is so 
anxiety. I've only had it like once, and even then it was like a long, long time ago. What's that for a quiz next? Crack a barrel? No, we're not. Thank you, though. I'm live, by the way, so you can... I know it's mom and you. Um, Cracker Barrel is also another kind of more experienced than the food thing because they. So I, I give that a. Excuse me. A, like a lower rating of. Hey, it's Cracker Barrel rules is what you're actually eating. What's next? Waffle House. Okay. If, um, like, who goes to Waffle House at, say, for lunch or dinner, sober? <laughs> you, you, you don't. Like, nobody says, hey, let's do Waffle House for food. I know you're. <laughs> What's next? And I know later comes I hop, and that's going to be my same answer for I hop. Well, I I went there for um breakfast this year, and I ended up getting sick. Thank you for proving my point. <laughs> I mean, I still like it, but not necessarily one of the better times there. What's next on the way? Trips. I don't know what what trips is. Jamba juice. Are we calling Jamba juice a restaurant? Uh, That's what Lita has listed in the book. Hmm. Never had it, but last I knew, it was just literally jump and juice and bacon. What's next? Uh, Taco Bell. Okay, now. <clears throat> I do love me some Taco Bell. I can't say I care much for it. I don't like it all the time, but it does come in handy when like, I don't feel like making it at home. At all, it's just so good. I, don't know. I can do much better at home. Yeah. They haven't had my, pro- my problem with them is that they never have enough cheese for my nachos. Oh, that, yeah, that's a I can't wait. Like they, they never have enough for anything to go on anything. What are you talking about? This little bit of cheese, this little bit of meat. Like, come on now. And, and um, wing is, you know, it, it works in a pinch for a pizza. Yeah. Like it. Kind of the trick, but I was, I was much better. Something else than Taco Bell. Right. The last one. Tortillas in Atlanta, RIP, so I guess it's no, no longer running. I don't know what that is. Me neither. We also get some of Leah's favorite clothing brands, favorite clothing stores, and favorite shopping areas. And this is still 2003? Yeah, still 2003. Sean John has to be on there. 
Uh, no, it's not on there. Oh. For our favorite clothing brands, we have Bug Girl, Kickwear, I L L I G, Serious, Trip, Thrift Store Clothes, and a pair of scissors. As far as favorite clothing stores, we have Trash and Vaudeville in New York City, Commander Salamander in Washington, D.C., Junkman's Daughter in Atlanta, Red Balls in Melrose, California, Sirius in Melrose, California, and Soho in Mexico, and favorite shopping areas, Little Five Points in Atlanta, Montrose in Houston, South Street in Philadelphia, St. Mark's Place in New York City, Sunset Boulevard and Melrose Avenue in Los Angeles, and Hyde Ashbury in San Francisco. I've never heard of a single place you just mentioned. <laughs> like, literally, like, I've never. Nope. Oh. See, I'm not the only one that has the dog barking in the background. Yeah. I guess he just doesn't like clothes or shopping. Who does? <laughs> I think I'm not the only one that has a dark bark in the background of the podcast. So that makes me <laughs> feel better. Yeah. So she also talks about being in the women's title scene to that 2000 or a feud with Stephanie McMahon. Oh. Why am I sure my description such things? Because it's in the book. <laughs> well, yeah. In the book, I get that. Uh, and we also says that she hates the term diva. And and um, quadruple bonus stars, points, whatever. That two thousand three. That she said she had it. The term Diva. When Diva was all that was known in WWE. I had the term Diva. Like, how, how really? Like that? We're not Divas, we're women wrestlers. Yeah, and so we also get a list of Leah's favorite junk foods. Oh, can't wait to hear. We have German chocolate cake and just about any cake besides ones with fruit or cheese. Cream brulee, even better with berries. Breyer's mint chocolate chip ice cream. Little Debbie's, especially nutty bars, Swiss cake rolls, and star crunch. Peanut butter cookies, or just about any other cookies, anything with marshmallow, Boston Market cornbread, and TCBY white chocolate mousse yogurt. As somebody that can't eat sugar, I despise this list. I despise it. <laughs> uh, I, I, like, I like Swiss cake rolls. Those are good. I just can't eat them. Like, I'm Right, uh, right. See, I'm... Um, <clears throat> I throw in some cheesy fries or something in there, uh, but everything on our list was, was sugary. I can't do all that. I agree with none of that list. Like, nope. Throw some bacon somewhere in there. <laughs> so Lita also says that she and the Hardys were the true innovators of intergender wrestling. There was some male versus female stuff for us, but nothing with the excitement and energy of the things we did. W would you agree with that? Actually, I do. Yeah, uh, I do too it, as well. It... it 
there were some things before, but the, um, so you can't really call them the innovators of it, but, uh, holy crap, kind of moment came with the Team Extreme stuff. Like, she can hold her own. Male, female, didn't matter. It, it didn't matter before to a certain degree, but this was more of a widespread, more of a bigger audience. So, okay, Lita can be in there and, and face so and so and hold her own. I, I agree with that. We also get a recipe for Lita's Mexican style Chevex. And as well as a list of her favorite foods, steamed tofu, black beans, guacamole, Steamed dumplings, steamed spinach, barbecue, sweet and smoky, not the vinegary Carolina style, artichokes, broccoli, tomatoes, onions, garlic, sushi, fajitas, no green peppers, vinaigrette dressing, peanut sauce, cottage cheese with soap. pineapples, California style burritos, miso soup, yellowish green bananas, chevec, of course. You lost me at tofu. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you, you just, nope. Uh uh. Not doing it. Nope, 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 nope. So then we talk about um, Lita and Dean Malenko's feud. This is a very underrated. Yeah, it was a very entertaining for, feud. It, but it, it, it's underrated for, I guess, a few good reasons because of timing. But if you take I mean, Dean Malenko is Dean Malenko. Lita is freaking Lita. Like, that's... And somehow they, to some degree, watered it down a little bit. Like, if you take today versus then, And give them time and whatnot. Give them story and time. That would have been such a, a more than already good. It could have been a great feud. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, but it was still entertaining. It was cool to see Lita. So we'll get some character development. Um, same with Malenko as well. Seeing him in that kind of a role was yeah. sort of unique because you were so used to see him as sort of the serious, almost bland in a way kind of wrestler. But then that feud really gave him some personality. Yeah. It, it was... It, it, it turned out I, I can't say great. It turned out good. Yeah. But and this is where I get a little more critical than I should be. Kind of thing. Like I have a, a couple different things would have been different. Like damn, we did work this. Dave Malenko, 
It beats China versus Jeff Jarrett. Yeah. Because, well, but what is it? I mean, that's um, pretty much a given. <laughs> yeah. Like, this. I took the easy way out. But yeah. So then we get a top Leah's list of top ten foods I really, really hate. Num number one is mustard. Number two, pickles. Number three, mayonnaise. Number four, green peppers. Number five, watercress. Number six, carrots. Number seven, cucumbers. Number eight, sour cream. Number nine, sausage. And number ten, brown bananas. This is obviously a red. Right. What do you mean by that? <laughs> um, this wasn't like um, this is obviously a. Uh, a, there's no wrestlers. Let's see. To be um, if you're talking about canned fruit or fresh fruit, being her. Did I miss something in there in between? No, I don't think so. They're doing like a, a top 10 rivalry, and they're all like fruit related. Uh, I mean, Becky trying to open up a, a, a can is one thing. <laughs> Sorry, had to, had to. You know, I, you know, I did. Yeah. I get my paybacks, like, fully but surely. Burger King. <laughs> I got some payback of my own. <laughs> Son of a gun. Like, I gave you one jab and you just come back with like a <laughs> shot to the face. <laughs> and obviously, um, no, we're two different people. Not you and I. Well, you and I are two different people, too. But there's some of her. And food just don't really kind of, I don't want to say set with me well, but like, man, I have a, I love this food, I, I don't like this food kind of thing. Where's where some of the, the good food like on your, your, your life list? So it also talks about um, Team Extreme's feud with Stone Cold and Triple H. Are we actually calling that a feud? Mm, it was sort of like a mini feud, sort of. Yeah. That, if that isn't scary. Injury and timing issues, then I don't know what does. Yeah, and that's what she even says. Oh, like, the, she... like, The Rock was filming Scorpion King. Um, Stone Cold had just turned heel. 
um, all the WCW people were coming in, so there was a lot of changes. And um, Stone Cold Sonny Leo was like the first real heel heat that Stone Cold got. I get that. She also doesn't speak fondly of tough enough. Saying that it made a mockery out of what everyone in the locker room had to go through in, in order to make it to the top of the business. And saying to her, I don't know. She came through. I, I forgot tough enough was still a thing or was a thing in 2003. Yeah, it was one's like third season in 2003. Yeah, and uh, and for again for whatever reason, um, I guess for a brain died there for a moment. Before there was the NXT game competition. It was tough enough for two seasons, three seasons, something like that. Or are you talking about later? Um, in the book, she talks about the first ever tough enough. Okay, so that'd be later. Yeah, it was uh, like 2001. Oh. And, and see, this is where the time frame and uh, I, I don't, I remember some but I don't remember tough enough being a quote-unquote thing. Shut up, Peter Griffin. All, all the good footage were talking about stories. They're meaning to the dumpster. That's what I heard, trying to go inside and get a, a cigarette. <laughs> That's just kind of going back to the food reference earlier. No, they're here over there. I don't, I was kind of out of, I haven't taken a, like a long break, but I, I did miss some stuff. So. Watching things or especially internet related. I guess tough enough to one of those. The early tough notes. I don't recall tough, tough notes being a show back in 2001. To be honest. Yeah, and Lita also talks about China, uh, China being very um, hard to deal with um, near, near the end of her run, and how their match at Judgment Day 2001 was sort of a disaster, because China didn't really want to give any offense, saying that China wasn't too crazy about going into the women's division. That, that's a, a, another subject. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know where it's at. 
that's going to be like my defense. But there, there's so much out there. And I, I, I don't want to do it on a podcast that's not my own. But Joni Laurie had obviously some problems, issues, that kind of stuff. I'll leave it at that until next time. Yeah. So she also talks about working with Tori Wilson and Stacy Keeber, and she calls them the blondes in the book. She also tells a story about one time how Stacey Keeber was, was getting too close to Matt Hardy and Leah ends up smacking her in the back of the head and she ends up falling down. And years, years later, we're, we're still getting the... You're blind, you're getting close. Pretty much different circumstances. Man, if that's not a psycho, like I guess, like a better wording. Um. Just, um, I do need to call my brother if we can, uh, I'll say wrap this up because this is the podcast. Um, yeah, I'll try and uh, wrap this up real quick. Because we're just about much of the way done. Just a couple more big spots to talk about. So she talks about Matt and Jeff Hardy feuding for a very brief time in late 2001. This was after... Was this after or before the Tim and Stream became a thing? This was after. This was after the invasion yeah. angle ended. So we can all like agree. The invasion angle is like what the hell? Yeah, like even Rita buries it in the book. Nice. Like every storyline you had just went to crap. Not every storyline, but just the smaller storylines. Uh, now we're doing this. What the? Yeah, so she also talks about um, being on various game shows like Fear Factor and The Weakest Link says that she hated being on The Weakest Link. Is that your final answer? Uh, th that was who wants to be a millionaire. Oh. Uh, I, I know my early 2000s game shows now. <laughs>
I give uh shoot because I just brought this up earlier. Ah, uh, shoot. Because it's been parody too much. Fine. Uh, so Lita goes on to um, guest star in Dark Angel, and that's where she ends up injuring her neck because um, the stunt that was, she was working with accidentally drops her, and she lands right on her neck, right on her head and shoulders, and nobody really believes that she's actually like injured or hurt or anything like that. And later on, it's revealed that she has a broken neck. Oh, surprisingly, Sasha came out of summer film 2016 without one all right dude um uh, have to say that was a bad spot yeah, the whole match was pretty bad yeah it was, it was a little further than bad but that's why. A, it doesn't even make sense what you're trying to do. B, even if, like, oh, I was trying to do this, I is still. What happened here? Why, why is, I get bad. That's why I aggravates the crap out of me. Aggravates me even more with with the Charlotte so crazy thing. Charlotte's so great. Um, and yes, this was two years ago. And she's Sense. Good Lord. Yeah. I don't want to say almost killed somebody, but everybody overshadows that spot. So she ends up having successful neck surgery. Um, on Dr. Lloyd Youngblood. She talks about her recovery, you know, watching various shows like Trading Places and the I Love the 80s series and stuff like that. Or I Love the, um, yeah, I Love the 80s. Trading Spaces and all that stuff. And she also talks about working with animal shelters while her, as well as um, commentating on Sunday Night Heat. And I'm, I'm sure people listening are like, so then I hit was still a thing? Yeah, it was still a thing. Like, it had become, like, sort of like the Jabra show, like, main event is now. But it was still a thing that was happening. Yeah, it wasn't, like, the lead in on MTV, like it used to be. And it, it was still there. We also talks about her dog tragically dying, and um, she also talks about planning on making a return to the ring. And that's really where the book ends, really. And she also ends it with an epilogue and has five goals for the future. Number one, continue to innovate the role of women in wrestling. Number two, be featured in a comic book. Number three, put out a new book unrelated to wrestling. 
Number four, utilize her free time by working with motivated individuals on pet overpopulation education and responsible pet ownership. And number five, keep on having fun with the gift of life. She succeeded in all five of those, right? What? She succeeded in all five of those. Um, as far as I know, I don't think she has a new book out yet. Well, I, I consider the, the new book thing being the book that she doing this in. Not new now, but when she said that, she accomplished those five things. I got a new book and and, uh, the other four have have happened since this book kind of thing. I got I think those five have happened. I don't know about the head six question, the dog chase question. Getting closer. Yeah, and so that pretty much ends the book. And um, judging from this review, what did you think of the book? Well, um, coming into the book, I I love Wade. Like I love Animal. Like I just yeah, not just a, a love thing or anything like that. Like I just she captured me and you have to realize like I'm kind of old. Um, Amy DeMoss, Lita, like, holy crap, they can't do this stuff. Like, it isn't just stuff. Bras and panties and stuff like that. They can do a lot more. Because I wasn't already stupid on, like, I knew they could, but they can be presented on TV as such. The, the book really solidified their, um, there's a, a person behind the character. It's not about my, my thong showing and, and we can do this just as well. Give us a, a chance. Just give us time. Just give us again. I'm, I haven't read the entire book, but just the excerpts and excerpts and and what I I do know. This was a, uh, and this coming out in 2003, that was 15 years ago. 15 years. She's not wrong. I will. Buy the book, and I'll, I'll read it cover to cover. She makes very valid points, and, and I, I'm always a, a sucker for the quote unquote behind the scenes stuff. You may have thought this, but this is, is what it was actually happening. Now, her 
WrestleMania 19, and if you know this for a fact, one of the few consoles I don't own is a GameCube. So I would have to buy the game and the console. The book is definitely a buy. Is everything interpreted different differently? You can read it and think this. I could read it and think that. Now, as far as the way the book goes, it seems seems to come come across as very. Genuine, very here. My dog's in the background. Sorry. Um, very. This is what happened, and I don't see very much like begrudgement about. They made me do this, or they made me do that. It's my opinion. Yeah, um, overall, WrestleMania 19, the game, was is a great game. Um, certainly very fun. And Aaliyah's book was pretty good as well. Was, uh, I think she has a really fascinating, really unique life story. And it was cool to be able to read all about it. WrestleMania 19, just taking two things about and throw on a railroad track with these going. Even if I end up getting beaten up. So. <laughs> hey, now at least we have most of it. Yeah, so I think this just about does it for this episode. Though. Where can they find you at, Mox? They can find me at. Fireman sixty eight zero nine on Twitter. Um, um, every Wednesday at ten Eastern, nine Central, eight Mountain. Co herding the violent risk podcast with. Ambrose Alley. And also do the, the Thursday podcast. This is a, a weird week for me because I'm doing three podcasts in a day. On Thursday, I do Wake Up Wrestling with Thomas S. K. Green. You can find us on smartcity.com Yeah, and you can find me on Twitter at MelMat15, and I also hang out in the daily and the nightly on Cage Side Seats. I'm just posted in the nightly. Tonight, Officially marks the end of the SummerSlam Summerfest, which is SummerSlam 2017. Um, it was a solid show. Not too spectacular, but not too awful either. You've been through wars. Yeah, yeah. There, there's been plenty, plenty of worse SummerSlams. We have to get now something on. So, Matt, for uh, not only the SummerSlam. Because he's watched it from start to finish, but he also did it for WrestleMania. Yeah. And yeah, there's some there's some great ones here and there, but if you never watched WrestleMania from the first one to the last one, and then you followed up with SummerSlam from the very first one to the Metal Match just 
and enders and so so why are you watching this <laughs> he's a trooper But yeah, I was saying on the SmackDown threads and the NXT threads as well on Kate's side. And so that just about does it for this episode. Next Friday, going to be another brand new episode. Um, next week will also be a special double episode because George from Two Guys Want Sport and now Carnosaurs of Wrestling, George will be joining me to talk about both Unforgiven 2003 and WWE Raw 2 exclusively on the original Xbox. So that will be a fun episode to do. So a new episode next Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central. So that just does it. So that just about does it for Ruthless Regression Era podcast. And we will see you all next time. See ya.